it is it gra glass fl uh, framed you have a no, no it's just it's just, it's just a wooden frame with um it's just a wooden frame but they they did do a good job in like i don't know if they put after they they hand wrote all the brackets they don't do then. that anymore right they don't hand yeah it anymore. was like it was like an art form i remember when eric guerrero um when he won our sophomore year i was laying in his living room and he had he had his bracket sitting there on the floor and i was looking at it and i'm like it's literally like a piece of art because every bracket's different right and so it was done in calligraphy by hand by someone there but i think when they finished it I don't know if this is right or not, but I think they sprayed something on it because oh. it's held up really well for not having glass in the you're, front of you're it. You're probably right. Yeah. That but it's cool. Wild. That is yeah, wild. It's old. It's old now. That, that there are people really in bars good. drinking that were, um, there are people that are now drinking in bars that weren't even born when that thing. That, that was that, my first NCA tournament. 98? Yeah, that was, that was, I, it was amazing. <laughs> it was so cool. One. Was that was so one. cool. Hey, Teague, was that your junior year? Yeah. Yeah, my uh, – I never redshirted, so it was my true junior year. And that was the year that um, David Morgan from Michigan State, he pretty much handled 118 that year. And that was the weird year of different weights. We, like we, – we made the weight cut at the beginning, and then the three guys died, and so right. they paused the season – and then they gave everybody seven pounds, but they still called it 118, right. even though we were weighing in at 125. 125. Yeah. And we only had one weigh in at the nationals that year. That was nuts. Wow. That, I, that's what I wanted to dig into once we, you know, get going. I, I wanted to, cause I, that was my junior high school. So I was kind of like, that was wild, just wild hearing all these stories of, right. It was creatine, right. That was the catalyst. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But, but you know, what's weird is they won't ever admit that. They right? never really talked about that. Right. They never really talked about that. It was when creatine came out and everybody was using creatine, mm -hmm. right? It was new. It was new. And we were all still cutting massive water weight. Like it was not a big deal to come in on a Monday for a Friday weigh in and be 18 over. That was not, Jeez. that was wow. not uncommon. And then, cause you, you knew the last 24 hours, like if you were anywhere from nine to 11 over, you were good. Like, that was not a problem because everyone had their routine that they would get warmed up and then get their sweat going. And then bam, you'd bang off six or eight in your first one. And then you'd go get a little bit to eat and drink. And then you'd come back and you'd do another one that would lead you right up to weigh-ins. Holy yeah. cow. And for a little guy, like that was a lot of percentage, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. That was I, a lot of water. I talked with um, coach Beachler cause he was kind of the guy, one of the guys behind that about two months ago. And he talked about the whole process. And he was saying how close they were to cutting wrestling. I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah. We, wow. we had a, we had a, we had a very bad, not only a bad reputation, we had a bad attitude. I think within the NCAA, we were kind of like, we were, we wanted to be the bad boys that did our own thing and we didn't want to adhere to any administrative rules. We didn't want people telling us what to do with our sport. And we're really fortunate that some people stepped up and, and saved us. Cause they could have very well just said, that's enough. It goes by the way, like boxing did, you know, we could have disappeared. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So wild, man. That is wow. And I, yeah, the, the bracket, the bracket though, just looking at the bracket, it just, it tells such a story. Like you're saying, you can look on there and the names and there are guys on that bracket. I'm sure who you see still, Oh, and yeah. it just probably tells so many stories, man. Who were the eight All-Americans? You know, so you pinned Morgan in the finals. It was you two. Who were the other six All-Americans, if you can remember? Or you don't, you look back there. You can cheat. So there, there's two Olympic silver medalists. There's, I'll, I'll just run down the list. So me, Morgan, Eric Jurgens, who I believe was a two-timer. Stephen Abbas, who ended up being a three-timer. And then Jeremy Hunter, who won it once. And um, Brandon Paulson from Minnesota, that was the other silver medalist. Wow. Uh, and then there That's was your way. John, uh, <laughs> our, uh, Tim Dernlin from Purdue. Yeah. Wow. And, wow. He's an Ohio guy. Yeah. Yep. And then John Carvalera from, I believe he was from Ryder, I think. That was the eight. 
Goodness gracious. <laughs> Who didn't place? There's probably some guys. I mean, Abbas, that's the only year Abbas didn't win it. Um, there's a good one in here that didn't place. There was, there was a, there's a kid from Iowa state named Cody Sanderson that didn't place that year. <laughs> You're yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. He'd have been a freshman, right? Yeah. Correct. That uh, Shane, Shane Valdez, who, who ended up being a three-time all American, but he did not place that year. That was the one year that he didn't place. <clears throat> um, yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole slew of good names in there of, of guys that, like you said, that I'll still see at at tournaments and as it is with any wrestler, you you grow up going against these guys at cadets and juniors and it's interesting. Like Jeremy Hunter and I, we were wrestling in Pennsylvania in youth and then we wrestled all the way up through the Olympic trials together and we still see each other when we're coaching him over at Illinois and so it's cool. And, it's and you're both whip hill guys, right? Yeah, correct, correct. Wow. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, Pennsylvania. Is there a place? I mean, is there a better place to recruit? Tell me that. Um, I think they kind of come in waves. They come in waves. They come and they go. Jersey a few years ago was definitely the hot spot to be, right? Ohio has its peaks. California has its peaks. Um, even even like a New York has its peaks. Um, and they'll come through with waves. I think that has to do with like the clubs and you'll get, you'll get a good club with a really good magnetic coach that guys will start to gravitate to. And then there might be one or two different clubs, like maybe rival clubs that other kids start. So you'll get a wave of a lot of kids that really get into wrestling and start training really hard and they feed off of each other and then they beat each other up and they get better, you know, but like, I think Illinois. Illinois. That's a great one. You know, that's a great one. Um, It's definitely cyclical. Like you'll go, just look at Whippeals, my home region or or district 11. There's some years where it's just jam packed and you're like, holy smokes. Um, But then you go back other years and it's fairly light. And, you know, you maybe only see 15 or 20 D1 wrestlers come out that are really solid. And then there's other years you'll go back and there's, 35 or 40 kids that are coming out going division one from, from just those districts right. from just the whippy or just district 11. It's crazy numbers. And district 11 is Lehigh Valley. Yeah, correct. Lehigh Valley. Sorry. And district six is whip Hill, Pittsburgh area, Western PA, Pittsburgh. Uh, no district seven. We're district That's seven. Di- you're district seven. Yeah. What district six is where like Nolf is from like, yeah, a little more part well, that's uh, no, east of. Nolf, Nolf was Whippeal, but he was double A, which double A encompasses, yes, district six in double A, but in triple A, it's just district seven. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because they, that's they, confusing. It, yeah, it is. In double A, they wrestle the Whippeal. And then the next week, they go to a regional, which goes over to uh, like Johnstown. So it, it moves further east and encompasses the, in double A, it encompasses another area. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That, that's a little confusing sometimes for me when I'm talking it to people. Yeah. And they, they throw that in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, good. Well, what's but, up? I appreciate you guys having me on. I haven't done a podcast in, in I don't know how many months. So I just appreciate you guys reaching out and I love talking wrestling. So. I appreciate you guys doing this. Thanks for making the time, man. It's been yeah. uh, you're on the you know when we started brainstorming this, you know how many months ago, Zeb? You, know, you were definitely on top of the it's list. It's years, and, years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really years. years. I've been, been trying to get him to do it for years. He won't listen to me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> he, he's the he's the guy. So no, thanks. So here we are, Barbarian Hour, right? Nice, nice. <laughs> So what would you guys like to cover? What uh, do you guys have a format that you follow or we just, uh, Hey, I run and gun. You got to know that about me. I just run and gun. Come right. on. He right. runs hey, and is guns. There any, uh, yeah. And then, is there uh, anything going on in DC? Is there anything going on in Washington DC today? I don't know. I was, I was on campus <laughs> for practice this morning. I got about 50 texts from friends asking if I was going to be anywhere in the downtown area. And then I came home and my, uh, my 15 year old daughter said, dad, can I put on the news, which is a rare thing in our house. We don't put the TV on very much. 
uh, cause I don't have cable. I have like broadcast. Mm-hmm. I got like, you know, a digital antenna outside. So I just get DC and Baltimore stations and sure enough, the news was just going nuts. So, so crazy stuff today, man, like historic, yeah. crazy stuff. And how yeah. far are you guys from like the Capitol building? I know because I took a train and you picked me up. Yeah. I have, I have a grasp, but for people watching this, how far is American university from like DC, the mall area and where Capitol Hill, the white house and all that is. Two, two and a half miles from from the White House. Like it's basically 2.8 from campus to the White House. Basically straight up, if you were at the White House and you go up Massachusetts Avenue, which is where all the foreign embassies and consulates are, so they call it Embassy Row, you drive up Massachusetts Ave and then you hit Homeland Security and American University. We're kind of at the end of that. Um, but we're in a, we're in a very... Um, It's a residential part of DC. It's got kind of a high net worth residential area. So a lot of those dignitaries that work in the embassies and consulates along Massachusetts Avenue, they live in the properties that surround American University. So most of those properties that surround the university are anywhere from two to $10 million properties. And there's a lot of black SUVs that come in and out of that area. Um, So it's kind of unique in that sense, like um, it's a very safe part of DC. Um, literally 10 o'clock at night, you could go run off campus around our area and it's very, very safe, which most people, there's a misconception about DC. Like it's, it's got, it's, it's got bad statistics, but where American university is located, the statistics are very good, you know? So the 1980s did those bad statistics to you. It was yeah. like, cause it was the worst crime in the 1980s. I remember that during the crack ac- epidemic. Epidemic, yeah. DC, yeah, DC had, that was like the epicenter of that. And that was a, you know, a large part of that was, you know, it carries over into people's perception of Washington DC today. I was so impressed when you picked me up and I came out of the, what do you guys just call it? The subway? I don't even know what yeah, it's the called. Yeah, the Metro, the Metro. The Metro, yeah. yeah. I, you were like, oh, I'll take the Metro to this. And I was there like that. I come out, you're waiting for me. We went onto the campus. I was super impressed. And you just, yeah, I, I, I really thought the school was awesome. And we were walking on the middle of campus and it was like a movie was being shot. Yeah. There were kids everywhere. I don't know if you know, it was, remember, it was a beautiful day. Yeah. And there were kids, there were hundreds of kids out hacky sack and whatever, throwing football around. It was a really cool, it felt like I was in like a movie, like a, like, like they were shooting a movie, like old school or some movie was there. It was awesome. So uh, we're kind of, we're like, I tell people in recruiting, we're kind of a hidden gem because most people, they don't know about American university. But when you come to our campus, when they built it, they structured it in such a way that like the heartbeat of campus is called the quad. So it's these four large grass areas that are surrounded by, our academic buildings, which are all done in a, in a very nice, similar style, white marble, right? So it's, it's beautiful to be on. This, this past year, we were rated as the number four most beautiful urban campus in the country. And, and mo- many people don't expect it. A lot of recruits and their parents, when they show up on campus and they start walking around, they get very wide-eyed because they read Washington, D.C. on their GPS when they were coming in. So they have an expectation of, they think they're going to be on a concrete campus like down in the city, right? And then they pull in to this beautifully landscaped, I mean, we're we're a national arboretum as a campus. So everything on campus from trees to plants to flowers, floral and fauna as all that are all marked and taken care of very well. And so when people come on, they're really kind of blown away at the aesthetics of it. Um, And the university just does, they do an incredible job of, of upkeep. That's awesome. Yeah. The other thing that blew me away about you guys is how um, it, it, you know, the internationally recruited, I remember that um, uh, Mark Cody had some, he had some uh, Mongolian guys on the team. Yeah. You had the Hawaiian connection with the Taraos. Yeah. That was right. awesome. Yeah. That, listen, ho- I remember cause I entered when we went to Hawaii, that was a great trip by the way. Yes, it was. I, we got to make that trip happen again. Uh, D1 wrestling on the island on Oahu. Uh, but I remember going and I interviewed the dad. I interviewed the, the boys and the dad. 
And the dad was just so excited. Mr. Terrell was just like so pumped. How yeah. do you guys have, how are you able to cast such a wide net? Is it DC? What would you say the main thing is that draws these kids from such a wide area? Teague? Well, number one, the, the, the name of Washington DC attracts those type of guys. Right. And what you just mentioned, they're not your common blue chip recruit. So we, we do a very deep job of going through a lot of recruits names in bios and everything like that. We have to really do our homework. When you look at the academics that they're going to have to upkeep, the specialties of what American university is good at. That's why some of those foreign guys fit in very well with us. We have almost 18% international student body on campus. So a lot of foreign nationals that are, that are getting their education at American. And then when you look at somebody like the Torals, David was a really great pickup. Kyle Borshoff, who's now the head coach at Binghamton, Kyle was out at Fargo when David took second, he lost to Gilman in the finals. And uh, Kyle went over to him and just said, Hey, I heard you announced you're a senior, but you haven't decided where you're going to go. And he said, yeah, I'm probably just going to go to the university of Hawaii and, you know, just continue doing judo and that sort of stuff. And so Kyle picked up the conversation from there and sure enough, a week later, he came out to America and did his visit. He was sold. And it was, it was just a really good fit for Josh and David, because I think the uniqueness of American university in a place like DC they're looking for that. They, they, they grew up on the island, right? Then you come to DC where you could jump on a train and be in New York City in three hours, right? Um, you've got Philadelphia close by. When Lindy and Deb, their, their dad is Lindy, their, their mom is Deb. When Lindy and Deb would come over to DC, they would always come for two or three weeks and then they would travel all over. They would go up to New York City, they would do Philly, they would drive to Chicago. If we were in Midlands, they would go down to New Orleans to get that experience. So they took advantage of the boys being on the mainland and then they just absorbed as much as they could. So I think there's a uniqueness for us that we have a unique academic rigor that brings a lot of them in, right? They look, they're usually really good students. So they're looking for something unique. Um, we just signed another guy from Kyrgyzstan that that I'm really excited about. I think he's going to adapt really well to folk style. It'll probably take him a year or two to transition, but I think you're going to see another good foreign guy for American here in the next coming years. It's Kyrgyzstan guy. It's yeah. Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. Cause uh, Samat at Pitt is from Kyrgyzstan. Okay. Yeah. He's, it, it, small he's country. Top. Yeah. Small country, right. It's a, it's one of the old Soviet bloc countries, but like really, really good wrestling in terms of like how they develop their young wrestlers they come through that kind of old soviet system that they get a coach at the youth age and then that coach sticks with them through their you know early high school and then their their post secondary school education as they're developing in a wrestler they keep that coach with it so they don't branch out into other systems they're very good at what they do right That's awesome he, he, he ended up, the, the guy that we're bringing in, Shamil, he, he was a bronze medalist um, over at uh, Cadet Asians. So, which it's a very solid international tournament. That's yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Hey, and then you stole the show at the uh, 2016 uh, Madison Square Garden with Terrell. Yeah, David he stole did. The yeah. Show. He, had a great, he had a great tournament and he became yeah. like the darling of the tournament. That's huge <laughs> for you guys too, yeah. in Madison Square Garden, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, when, when people ask about it, it was literally like living a movie because we went there, David really, he, he had a horrible EIWA tournament. It was the only EIWA tournament. I think he placed fifth that he didn't place, you know, his freshman, sophomore, junior year, he was like second, second or third, every tournament and qualified his way through nationals. And then his senior year, he took fifth. He just, he had two bad matches at EIWAs. He had to get an at-large bid to get in. And then he ended, he fell into the bracket as like a 15 seed. And so that put him against Joey Dance, who was a two seed, I think, um, two or seven. I can't, I can't remember how the numbers worked out, but David had a, a good matchup against Dance. He had beaten him three times and lost to him once. So 
we had to be prepared and ready going into that match. And, but, but we also knew if we strategically played the match as we should, David had a really good chance to win it. And he did, he put a really good ride on and quickly got out of bottom and that good stuff. So you talk about we and the recruiting and the coaching there. Who who are some of the staff you have there and you know, some of the oh, key, key people? I'm I'm hurting right now. I lost Jarek Kaznick, my 197 pounder. Jarek uh, stayed with me and did grad school doing a master's program in business. And, and in April, he got a really good job offer in DC to go with a financial company. And so Jarek left. The university had a hiring freeze, has a hiring freeze in place. So I couldn't fill my second assistant position. And then uh, Eric Wentz, who had just come on board with me as a head assistant, ended up getting the head job at Fort Hayes State out in Kansas. And so currently I'm the head. I don't have my head assistant or second assistant filled yet. And so my volunteer position is gone by our Sanja, who's a Mongolian, was a two-time All-American at AU. Uh, once under Mark Cody and then his senior year uh, was with me. He He's our volunteer assistant. Um, so it's he and I basically helping keep this moving together right now until we can get through this and get back to hiring. So, wow. Yeah. You and Sanja. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. That's tough, dude. Teague, it's that's real not tough. easy. It's real tough. And we actually pulled off we got a really good recruiting class coming in. So I, I shared with you, we have Shamil coming in from Kyrgyzstan. We got a kid named Max Leet coming in from uh, Massachusetts, who was a Fargo and an NHSCA All-American. And um, who else do we have? Lucas White coming out of Missouri, uh, Christian's brothers, who's now, he's ranked uh, pretty well in his weight class. Um, we got another one from California, Karsten Rawls, that placed last year. He's going to be bigger. He's going to be like a 97. Um, and then we got one out of Colorado, a two-time state champ out of Colorado, um, that I think he's going to do, he's going to do really well for us. So our, our recruiting class this year, albeit such a weird year, like none of these guys could come to campus. We couldn't go to see them. So we had to do all recruiting online and zoom calls. And it was just like, in my 20 years of coaching, this is it's not even, there's not even a close second of how bizarre and brutal this year has been since March 13th. It's just been brutal to deal with. Um, how is Sanja? How does Sanja do with, because, you know, he is English is his second language, yeah. right? I mean, how does he do recruiting? That's got to be tough too, right? There's a little bit yeah. of a language barrier. Yeah. It's, Ghana doesn't do much of our recruiting. Ghana, Ghana takes care of the guys in the room. <laughs> Ghana takes care of the guys in the room, right? You got to have a younger guy that can go in and work out. And so uh, Ghana, 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 Ghana does that really well, right? Uh, so yeah. he th that's a good answer. He doesn't do much recruiting. He doesn't do much recruiting. That's right. I now, when they come on campus, take. when they come on campus, anybody that's ever met Ghana, he, he's just so personable and his English is good. His conversational English is, is good. So he can hang out with the recruits and he explains, you know, what his process was coming through junior college and then to American and his time at university of Maryland, where he was an assistant. So from that perspective, he's really good, but no, he's, he's not going to pick up the phone and, and, uh, and be making many recruiting calls unless, unless they're Mongolian, then he can pick up the phone and <laughs> chat away. There you go. Chat away. <laughs> So, that's oh, awesome. that's awesome. Yeah, but you know, you lost Musser too, man. Yeah, Clint that was Musser's a, a genius, and that had to be a big blow, right? Clint's not only a genius from that perspective, he's just such a good, solid human being, right? Like, Clint, Clint and I had we had such a good relationship in the sense that we were, we were from the same era, kind of grew up in the same. He was Eastern Ohio, I was Western Pennsylvania, and we frequented a lot of the same youth tournaments. Um, and then we wrestled in college at the same time, a little bit of international at the same time, but life experiences, right? He's got, he's got a lot of life experience that he has a very good perspective from coaching in the sense of like, yes, we want to turn this guy into a national champion or an All-American, but we also want to make sure that he understands 
the opportunity that you get for the academics at a place like American, as well as saying to them, to any of our young men that we're working with, you've got to keep your head on your shoulders because life can spin out of control very quickly. And here's what you need to do to keep yourself in check. Here's a healthy way to live your life. Here are healthy practices and routines that you got to keep going. And honestly, like the four years having Clint here was so good for me because uh, we spoke the same language of what, what are our importance? What do we want every young man leaving American University to have control of in their life when they leave, right? Because it, it's, I'm sure all, all three of us could sit here and name names of like, you know, you saw national champions or multiple time All-Americans or guys that went on and did really well on the international circuit, but they didn't have areas of their life under control. And then when wrestling was done, they, they don't know where the next step is. They don't know how to make the next step. And, th and that to me has been one of the things in coaching that I said, I want to make sure every guy leaving my program, not just the all American or national champion, but the guy that was the four year backup on your team. I want them to know the next step in life when they take their shoes off, what are they going to do? How are they going to give back to wrestling? How are they going to handle themselves moving forward in life? I think that's, so important for everybody because if re if wrestling is all you have and it comes to an end there is a massive void in what are most we're like barbaric young men what are we going to fill that with you're going to fill it with booze women gambling like go down the list of bad things that you could fill the void with we will fill it really fast and it, right? it ends abruptly right i mean it ends quick <laughs> you go from being the, the guy that everybody knows, or you're getting to do interviews and stuff like that. And then in a matter of a couple of months or a year, you're kind of like you're yesterday's news. And I've seen a lot of guys that don't know how to deal with that. Right. And then they, they flounder for quite a while trying to find out who they are or what they're about or what they're trying to do. And that's just something I think it's important for all of us. Um, for me, it was a very person. It's a very personal thing. Like my brother, Ty, who is a great high school wrestler and, and wrestled at the University of North Carolina and was a very good college wrestler. He struggled with that. And as many people know, in 2014, he passed away from alcoholism, right, at a very young age. And um, helping, helping people under helping young men understand that as they're going through this process that you're going to have to learn how to adapt and deal with the end of your wrestling career, whether that maybe it's at the end of high school, maybe it is during college that you get burned out or you get injured, or maybe it's the end of college, or maybe it's international. At some point it's coming to an end. We, we should not be 70 wrestling with singlets on. It just shouldn't happen. Right. <laughs> so, so what are you going to do afterwards? Right. Who do you become afterwards? What, what do you, how do you see yourself? How do you view yourself? Those are really important things, I think, for everybody to understand because then the next step becomes a little bit easier. A great point. Teague, Teague that, that all great points. Uh, two, two things. First off, I remember the interview with you, um, you know, in Hawaii, in that like lobby area where we were, that like restaurant area where we were, where it was all these ponds all around. The so waterfall, wasn't there a waterfall or something? Yeah, there was like a waterfall and birds. Yes, and yes, <laughs> yes. It was no, but it was the lobby of the hotel or a restaurant, wasn't it? Yeah, correct. It was correct. something crazy like that. Uh, yeah. But the crazy thing is, you know, we talked about your brother, we talked about alcoholism, and we have these kids that are so high level, right? Ty Moore was a four-time Pennsylvania state champ, which is still really hard to do. Yeah. Um, right there. And, and, and right. It's crazy. It's crazy yeah. to think of the level he was yeah. and we lose focus. I think wrestling media and the wrestling community wrestling, we don't think about the four-year backup enough yeah. and what the four-year backup takes out of it. And the, maybe the one-time state qualifier, the person who never places, or maybe the guy who's a district qualifier or regional qualifier, or whatever it is, or the guy who never made the NCAs. I think we lose focus of how important it is for those guys. And the fact that you talk about that, so everybody else is always, ah, oh, we want all Americans, we want national champs, we want this, we want that. I don't hear that a lot from a lot of people. Do we, do we tend to not, we just don't focus on that a lot, I don't think. We, we don't focus on it, but it's interesting. I read, I read an article from the NCAA. This was when I was back at Clarion, so this is going back quite a ways. But it was, it was regarding 
gifts and endowments to athletic programs. And, and it's so interesting when I read the article and then I started going to wrestling facilities who on a, on a majority level are your donors that build the buildings. It was the backups. It's, it's the guy that like wrestled at the school for three or four years, maybe had some success, but just a little bit, then they left, they got into business and they became, you know, just something huge. And then the school needed to build a wrestling facility and they need a couple million dollars and they go, and that's where that guy steps up. And that's where they like, they see themselves as becoming the national champion for the school. Yes. I have the means to be able to give back and in their stories, a lot of times are very similar. They say things like I came into the practice room and I got clobbered by so-and-so who was the stud on the team. And every day I came into practice, I used to think if I could just score one takedown on this guy, right? And then they'll tell the story of how they, they left college, they started working a job or they started into an industry and they said, if I can just get this one sale done, if I can get this one deal done, right? And it was kind of like surviving in the wrestling room. And they equate that their success in business to what had happened in the wrestling room. And so those people are so integral to our sport because they've built buildings for us. They've endowed scholarships. They've now, you start to see the programs that are endowing their scholarship budgets, their assistant coaching salaries, their coaching salaries, that all these things are being endowed. And nine times out of 10, they were the guy that never saw the limelight on the mat. You know, they were always helping the national champion, helping the All-American. And then later on, they became their own kind of national champion, and then they get to give back. So that's kind of that, the big thing of, of when you build, for me, whether at Clarion or American, building the team out, I want as many guys in the room as possible for practice partners, but then also make sure they're getting developed because ultimately they're probably going to take care of your program down the road. It's a sport you need partners, right? You, at any level, right? It's not, you're not out on a track or in a pool, right? You have to have partners and then it's guys that persevere yeah. sometimes break through, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Hard, hard to be a national champion if you've been shadow drilling. <laughs> right. That's true. That's real true, man. So Teague, you know, like I, I've been covering you since those EWL years at Clarion and one of the craziest phenomenons ever, and you would tell me this stuff in interviews you would be like James Fleming, the snapper, is gonna change wrestling, and he literally did. did. Yeah, they changed the rules because of him. Remember that maniac? Yeah. No yeah. takedown. No takedown. What about the year he blew his knee out the NCAs? Were you there? That was that your last year. When he I was blew already. His knee out? I was already gone. I was you already, were already gone. gone. Do you remember that year though? Yeah, because he ended up wrestling gone by our in the, in the fifth and sixth place match and beat him. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. And yeah. just mean with one move. Yeah. So, so uh, funny story about that. When I was at Clarion, you know, this is going back 2000, this must've been 2007 ish. Uh, I get a package in the mail. It's a VCR tape, right? <laughs> and I open it up. It's a letter from his coach. And he says, coach, uh, you know, check this guy out, James Fleming. He's a couple times state place winner in Pennsylvania. I put the VCR tape in and I'm watching and I think, man, this dude is different. He is just, first, you hit the nail on the head. He had no offensive takedown, but he would give up a takedown and then he would reverse them. And then he was on top and then he would tech the kid, right? And it was because he had this really nice uh, kind of side headlock that he did. And so I watched the videos. Ethan Bosch was my assistant at the time when we were watching and we were both, we were in a debate in the office, like, is this going to work in college or is it not? And the one thing that I thought was where he was going to succeed in college, he was so physical when he wrestled. Like, even though he didn't have a takedown, his hand fight, he was also a boxer in Pittsburgh. He grew up uh, in, and did some like minor level boxing and I think he maybe won like a Pittsburgh Golden Gloves at one point, but his hands were really heavy when he hand fought. So we, we kind of like said, okay, he'll be able to learn how to hand fight in college. If he could learn one takedown, that'll be great. He's probably not going to be able to keep using the trick of give up the takedown and then reverse. That might not go very far. 
and then he came into college and like, sure enough, his, his physicality in college, the referees let him wrestle in, in high school, they kept stopping him. And I really think that's why he didn't win a high school state title in Pennsylvania. Cause he was so physical on top. They would call potentially dangerous all the time. And in the big matches, he couldn't advance into the finals. He would lose because he had seven potentially dangerous calls and no near falls. Well, in college, they let him wrestle. And then the next thing you know, he's turning really good guys over and, and beating them by eight and 10 and 12 points. He was a massive, and I tell Snapper this, I, when I do see him, like he was one of the toughest guys to coach ever because it was, it was a 24 hour a day process, right? Like it wasn't just two hours of coaching in the wrestling room. As soon as you got done with practice, your phone would ring and you'd be like, man, what, what, what went on now? And then you'd be fixing you'd be fixing that. And then in the morning, you'd find out something went on at night. And it was just a, it was, it was good stuff, but he ended up being a two-time All-American. So. Oh my God. And just like, so physical and mean, literally, I saw the guy commit five, 10 felonies in a match in a, in a match where he'd be losing two nothing going into the second period. He tech fall the guys. Yeah. Yeah. I remember UNC had this guy Burns. The guy was a high school national champ. He technical fouled this guy in the last minute of the match. I remember. Yeah. And the guy was just like, "What?" Like looking over at CD Mock, and he's like, "They can't do anything." I mean, they're stuck. Yeah, right? they're stuck. Yeah, they can't do anything. <laughs> what do you, what do, you and do, dude? Dude, it was crazy because he'd roll it up one day and he'd lock across their face. Mm -hmm. He'd lock right here, wouldn't he, Tig? Yeah. It was, it and felt then, like your jawbone was going to just, it was so tight on your jawbone. It felt like your face was just the, the bones were going to break. They were just going to shatter. And the guys could still breathe. That's like, if you ever mm -hmm. talked to John Stutzman, Stutzman would go nuts because he was like, and his, and his, his guys would say like, coach, it's really tight, but I can breathe, mm -hmm. but I feel like my face is going to explode. Well, they, in the USC, they say, sometimes they go across the face instead of the neck. Right. And it's like, yeah. they tap from that cause they can't take the pressure. <laughs> yeah. It's painful. It's pretty painful. wild. Yeah. So, so go and back. It, you, the, he was a fun you, one. You talk VHS, right. And the whole, you were kind of the forefront of the whole flow, flow wrestling, right. You guys kind of, yeah, that was, you know, took, I remember uh, when Martin, Martin made the drive to Clarion when he was pitching the idea. Yeah. Cause you and, guys were, the EWL was one of the first sites, right? Yeah. Correct. Correct. So you and I remember when, when he, I'm sorry, I keep go, interrupting. Go no, ahead. you go ahead. Yeah. So what, tell that early days, Martin, right? So, so Martin came in and he drove like this kind of, I think it was like an old beat up van, like conversion van, I think it was. And he had been making the rounds and he came in and he, he was pitching the idea of like, this is what we want to do to the sport of wrestling. This is how we want to cover it. And everyone's going to have access to it. And I remember, and I'm thinking, dude, this is a, this is a million dollar idea. Like this guy's got it. But then my next thought was like, how are you going to get to all these matches? Right. And he was like, I'm not, I'm going to find gurus of wrestling people that are wrestling addicts. Hence Zeb. Right. And I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to give these wrestling addicts, their heroin. I'm going to let them go and just film wrestling all the time. And sure enough, I mean, the next couple of seasons it took off and now look at our sport we, our sport probably couldn't exist right now in COVID if it weren't for the events that like flow is putting on, right. Or, you know, some of the others, the track wrestling and the rock fins and, but they, they kind of, he brought that idea about and succeeded with it. Do you have any stories of Zeb when you first remember Zeb? I mean, you guys go back um, quite a bit, but when you first do. meet Martin, you remember that, right. And when you first meet yeah. Zeb, you usually remember that. Zeb, I think, uh, I feel like our first real interaction was at Clarion, or did we have something outside of there before that? Well, I was traveling to all the schools, Tig, remember? Yeah. I would, do you remember I was like filming everything and you're like, why are you filming the dining hall? Yeah. I'm yeah. like, you're like, don't film that. You're telling me not to film stuff. I go, said, I was like, Tig, if I don't film it, I won't have it. And you're like, right. why are you filming that? Why are you filming the rec center? Why? You're taking me all over all of these buildings. And, you know, I mean, Clarion's campus is a little underwhelming. And you're like, why are you filming this? Why are you filming that? And I'm like, Tig, I need content to put on the site. When I do the campus visit, it can't just all be the classroom. 
And that's yeah. actually very true because yeah. there's so much more to going to college than just being locked in the Bob Bub wrestling room. Right. And, and well, you were, you were like, ah, why are you doing this? But that's what I do. I film everything. Yeah. And, and at that time, we never thought that we would be in a situation where like, so think about the kids that just got recruited this year. They had to see their campuses over the internet. So like work that you did gave them the opportunity to essentially tour a campus because I can almost guarantee you most of us wrestling coaches, we were caught with our pants down with this thing in March when we were told, okay, no national championships, no spring recruiting, no summer recruiting. And then we're calling kids and saying, Hey, do you, do you know about our campus? And they said, no, then we're scrambling to find out. I got to show them something else than a home match. Right. And so then the dining hall does come in. And I remember why I didn't want you filming in some of the buildings, some of the buildings you'd walk in and there was like literally paint coming off the walls and stuff like that. Right. You don't, you don't want to film that. Right. So, but now most of these campuses are state of the art. Like you, you see where some of these student athletes live or students live when they're on these campuses now it's not it's not your old dormitory you know cinder block, dor block dormitory it's just crazy to think about it and you know you're a guy you're you're the classic western pa guy right you're you're a north allegheny guy and you go to oklahoma state you go to the most storied program when you went they probably had 30 ncaa titles right 30 NCAA titles, right? 30 NCAA, yeah. they, got, they got 34 now. Right. Yeah, Sounds they probably had 30. Right. When they're recruiting you, they probably got 30. And you go out there and it's everything wrestling. I talked to this Vic Boinovich kid and he is so bananas head over heels to get to Stillwater, Oklahoma. He's like, it's everything's about wrestling there. Yeah. It's everything's wrestling. Wrestling this, wrestling that. Everybody loves wrestling. So you're, you're one of these guys and you went to two very opposite schools and you're a head coach at Clarion in Pennsylvania and American university in Washington, DC. And it's like, so your, your spectrum ends are so crazy. It blows my mind. Right. Cause it's like any recruit that goes to Stillwater wants to go to, they want to go to Oklahoma state. Yeah. They want to be a cowboy. It's just, just how it is. Right. Right. Well, no, not if you're smart and you want a good <laughs> education, then you come to American okay. Zeb. Come okay. on now. Okay. What are you doing? <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it's where you went and it was, it yeah. was, it's a no, but it's like Coleman Scott did the same thing as you, yeah. right? They're, you're these PA guys. You go out there and you're like, everything's wrestling. Yeah. Now, now hold on. You want to talk internships. You want to work in the federal government. I think everybody that has a brain is going to be like, yeah, you're going to want to go to American U. Right. You want to be in the FBI. You want to be in the Department of uh, Homeland Security. You want to be in, uh, you want to be in uh, NSA, any of that stuff. Obviously, you guys are the place. There's no right. question. And there's different so, needs. But when we're talking if wall to wall, crazy madness, tradition wrestling, it's Oklahoma State. Yeah. If you want, I, 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 I say it like this. If you want to major in wrestling, absolutely. You go to Oklahoma State, you go to Iowa. Now you go to Penn State, right? If you want to major in wrestling. Um, it, because it's overwhelming as a high school recruit, you know, when I, when I walked through Oklahoma state, that was the old Gallagher Iba and, and you see all the, back then we just had the NCAA championship, their champions names up. And then the board beside it was world champions and then Olympic champions. It was like, all right, I'm home. This is, I just got to figure out where I'm going to live. Right. Um, <laughs> but you're, you're right. It's, it's it takes a special, there's definitely, you have to have the itch. You have to have the bug that you want to wrestle 24 seven. And for me, it was a perfect fit. Like that is all I wanted to do. Um, I didn't have the academic, like I wasn't pursuing academics at the age of 19 when I left high school, like most of my wrestlers are at American. I didn't have a thought about anything other than the 2000 Olympics and 2004 Olympics like that. Those were my focuses coming out of high school. And so John Smith was there and he was in his heyday. And um, why wouldn't you, you, why wouldn't you go to the place that had the most storied tradition? And you were there. One of the most crazy, we talked a little bit earlier, one of the craziest years of wrestling, right? We're living in crazy times of the world right now, but 
97, 98 season, right? The three deaths. And yeah, you talked it a little was, bit about earlier, but fill us in was, on that. And, you know, wrestling as a lightweight and then you get the seven pounds and the, everything going on and pretty, pretty nuts. Yeah, it was, um, it was, a, it was a strange time because communication didn't happen like it happened today. So a lot of communication was like hearsay. You heard it. You were on a phone call with somebody from somewhere else and their coach heard this. There wasn't a lot of like, you didn't jump on the internet and figure out what was going on because Flo went and did an interview with somebody. So everything was kind of hush hush. And, and um, when that season, we had just gotten early into the season and you had heard the first death happened and you're kind of like, wow, that, that's strange. A college wrestler dying. It, something must have been weird, right? And then the second one happened and everybody was like, hmm, that's odd. Then the third one happened and everybody was like, whoa, something's going on. And so then the brakes got put on and I can remember Coach Smith t- telling us like, okay, we, we're not competing right now, but you can't let your weights get out of, out of control. Like we're going to compete again. We just don't know what the date is going to be. How long so, was that break? I think it was a little over three weeks. Oh. Like I feel like it was – early December when the third death happened. And then I think they wrestled Midlands that, that December. Uh, I think Midlands were the first competition with the seven pounds and the, the day of weigh-ins. Um, and so all those things started to shift and change. And I went through, I t- I've told this on other podcasts, so I, I apologize if anybody's listening and it's already heard this, but in college, I wrestled under four different weigh-in rules. So my freshman year, we did five hour weigh-ins. So if you had a 7 p.m. duel, you weighed in at two and then wrestled at seven. My sophomore year, we went to night before weigh-ins, right? And not only did we do night before weigh-ins, we had a few honor weigh-ins. That means (laughs) we would cut weight. Yeah, there was a lot of honor. A lot of honor. Come on. Well, that's what it is no, right now I in sw- Ohio. That's for high school right now. Yeah, yeah. You you would you would do your workout at home, uh, and then uh, one of your administrators would come down and oversee <laughs> the weigh-ins to make sure everyone made the weight they were supposed to. And then an you would administrator call your in Oklahoma, an administrator <laughs> in Oklahoma. <laughs> so, so uh, I went uh, through I went through that phase because we had. Um, there was one, there was an Oklahoma open, which is right around Thanksgiving time. We weighed in Thursday, which was Thanksgiving and the tournament was on Saturday. And the, and the tournament rule that year was you had to have your weigh-ins in by Thursday at like uh, 3 PM or something. And so, and then, but you were able to wrestle that weight on Saturday at the tournament. And then, so that was my sophomore year with the night before weigh-ins and sometimes on our weigh-ins. And then my junior year, it was night before, then the guys died, then they moved it to two hours. Everything was two hours, duels and tournaments. And then my senior year, we went to duels, one hour, tournaments, two hours. Wow. So yeah, and, and in that whole time, my freshman year, we had what they called growth allowance, which was the opposite of growth allowance. Your first way in was at 121 pounds in November. And then each month, I think it was, they took a pound off. So you started in November at 121, and then you went to 120, and then you went to 119, and then you finally hit 118 in like late February or March. And that's when you would make the actual national weight uh, back then. So yeah, there was was just a lot of changes that went on those four years of college. I never redshirted, so every year was different. Okay, So so when you won it, when you won it, Mm-hmm. It was it was a Thursday weigh in, so Saturday night Morgan had to be massive. Not that you weren't. We were both massive. Be, yeah, yeah. I, both you, I mean, he had to be even bigger than you because he killed everybody the whole year. He was undefeated. Yeah. He was massive. Um, they weighed us in on Thursday, but the NCAA asked us. Uh, we did these voluntary checks on Friday and Saturday because they were doing a study. Mm-hmm. They wanted to see what how much weight wrestlers were losing. And so on Saturday, I know I, on Saturday morning, I weighed in at like 142 and I'm assuming oh <laughs> David was, was just as close as I was. And Eric Guerrero, who was the weight above me, Eric was not much more than, than I was, even though he was wrestling up at 126, which was technically 133. But um, yeah, so that was just a weird year. 
you know, it's a, the bracket says 118, but it wasn't. Hmm. Wow. That's crazy. So is it, do they have it right? I mean, that was you know, how many years ago yeah. and not much has changed. Are the rules right? Right. Now? I think, I think, I think we, for the health of our sport, the reason why we're still around is because we made the right changes. Mm-hmm. I still, th- I think we can do better. That's what I'm asking. But, what, what's, what can we do better? Well, if we truly want to try to avoid weight cutting, I think weight management is good. Mm-hmm. But if we truly want to get away from cutting weight, because it, yes, I've heard all the arguments that weight cutting can be good in some ways, but let's face facts. It's not healthy if you're cutting 10 pounds of water. So just go to, go to Matt side weigh-ins. They do it in other sports. I know that old, there's some old timers and thinking that says, Oh, you can't do it. Cause a guy isn't going to be able to get his knee taped in time or anything like that. Listen, they run jujitsu tournaments. They run no gi tournaments with mat side weigh-ins. Like everyone shows up, they step on the scales and then they say, all right, those guys are over there on mat, you know, six, these guys are on mat eight. They all just stepped on the scale at the same time. And they, they truly do weigh the exact same. So mm-hmm. you, you get away from the crazy stuff of like guys cutting underwear straps in the weigh-in line at the NCAAs. We've all heard those stories, right? Cause they're still one tenth over, and they were sitting in a sauna all night, which they weren't supposed to be and all that crazy stuff that goes on. Right. right. Or it doesn't go on. <laughs> yeah. That, that year was wild. I mean, I was young, but just hearing the stories and Zeb, you probably know more than I, but uh, that's just a wild year. Right. And crazy. Yeah, to think 98, back. 98 was, it was 97. It was the fall of 97. Mm-hmm. When that guy was a Campbell guy, a Michigan guy, and Tig, what was the third guy? Two Michigan guys, right? Uh, no, it was University of Michigan. And then I feel like one of them was like a Davidson. You okay. said Campbell. Cam- but it was I thought Campbell. It was, Campbell. Was it Campbell? Campbell? And then there was a D2 or a D3 in there. Yeah, somewhere. that's what it was. Because it was two D1s and a D D3, I believe. It, yeah. it, and we and talked it, earlier, but it, it was creatine, right? That was the... That's what I think that the end result, when, when people really started diving into it, Mm -hmm. when you take creatine and then you pull massive amounts of water out of the body, your body will metabolize the creatine in the kidneys and essentially send poison back out into the bloodstream. And they went into cardiac arrest. Um, That was how it was explained to me. Look, Mm -hmm. I I didn't get a pre-med degree at, at Oklahoma state. I know that shocks both of you. (laughs) <laughs> but my, his, my history degree from Oklahoma State, when it was explained to me, it made sense, right? You're taking all this creatine. Now you pull all the water out of your body. Your kidneys need something, right, to function. So it takes the creatine in, metabolizes it, changes it into something that your body can't use and, and sends it back out into the body. And unfortunately, it's not, it's not good for your heart. I'm no doctor either. And my history degree from Kent didn't teach me much either, but... Uh... <laughs> Uh, nice. the creatine we're taking now is completely different than the creatine we're taking in the late nineties, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So who knows what, cre- you know, the creatine you two are taking, I don't need any creatine. I don't need to retain any more water. I'm good. <laughs> You're good. I'm, on your water. I'm good on the water retention. I appreciate it though. Uh, so Teak, uh, you know, we, we jump all over. We've talked about you competing as an athlete. We talk about, you know, as a coach a lot and we talk about all, all this stuff, but, being a little brother uh, of an, a Pennsylvania all-time great in Ty Moore. Ty Moore is a four-time state champ in North Allegheny. You grew up with one of arguably the greatest high school. You saw one of the greatest high school teams ever. I want to say the 87 Allegheny, North Allegheny team, right? Yeah, correct. 88. Crazy duel, 80, 87, 88. They had yeah. a crazy duel with St. Edward at North Allegheny, I believe. Right. Well, they had two. They had one at St. Ed's. That was the year we beat them in 88. And then they came to North Allegheny in 89 and they beat us. So each team that won, won on the road. Yeah. And there, there is. So uh, his, his, his name completely slips my mind right now. Alan Freed was on that 89 team though. Alan Freed was on the St. Edward team. He was on both. He, He He was on both. Yeah. He, he won in 88 and then Richie Catalano, Richie wrestled at Iowa and then transferred to Pitt and was an All-American at Pitt. Richie beat Allen at North Allegheny in 89. And Allen was the king of kings. Like Allen, when I was growing up, Allen was my idol because he's the, still to this day, 
I love this fact. Allen is the only Fargo four-time freestyle champion in juniors. In juniors, in juniors, in juniors. yes. In juniors, yes. He won it as a freshman, That's sophomore, junior, senior. Yep. So at that time, when I was watching him wrestle, he was on this massive pedestal for me. And he was Alan Freed. He had this long hair, right? He was like a guitar player, and he was just kind of crazy when he wrestled. He still and is. He's still he a still guitar is. player. <laughs> he yes. still is. Uh, yes. Richie Catalano went out. Richie had a really nice uh, bar series on top. And so I can't remember how it played out. I think Richie threw him because Richie also won Greco in Fargo. Uh, he went upper body through Al. He ended up on top. And then he ran a couple of set of bars and Alan couldn't get off bottom. And um, yeah, those were that, that was a fun one. I actually might have that VCR tape down in my basement when my I need and, it. I need it. I have a collection in my basement of VCR tapes from that whole era. My dad filmed Jeez. every match that my brother Ty wrestled from 87 to 90 in North Allegheny. So I have all of them downstairs in my That's basement. Awesome. I've just never taken the time to digitize them. It takes time. <laughs> it takes oh, time. It does. It does. Hey, it's maybe so when the, the Civil War is over in D.C., I'll come over <laughs> and maybe grab some videos from you. I'll, I'll put you in the spare bedroom and you can start, you can start digitizing. Yeah. Yeah. So real quick, you touched on, you know, something I wanted to ask you and you will always hear this conversation, right? Ohio on the feed, PA on the mat. And uh, we had our little buddy on a couple episodes ago, a couple of shows ago. And he, his question is always why, you know, our Kent state teammate, why, why, always, why, why is it that, you know, people blame the referees, you know, what, trace it back do you think there's some coaching you know some people in ohio say the milkovich is all about takedowns and things like that why is pa on the mat compared to ohio so this is just my opinion mm -hmm. but so if you look at pennsylvania wrestling you've got your clarions edinburgh's lock havens bloomsburg's right these were teaching colleges and so you had in the 40s 50s 60s all of these really good wrestling schools are teachers colleges. So their wrestlers come out with teaching degrees. They go back to their hometown, Tyrone, Pennsylvania, or, you know, Wexford, PA. And do boys. Do boys. They become the high school history teacher, mm -hmm. wrestling coach, right? So now you have high level D1 wrestlers teaching seventh, eighth, ninth grade, high, you know, high school wrestlers how to wrestle. And at that time, at the college level, mat wrestling, there, there, it was a whole different set of rules, right? You could essentially stall ride on top and win a lot of matches. Um, you didn't have to be a takedown artist. So in Pennsylvania, the way that I saw it and have just read and I've even watched some films on it, when you see that old school college wrestling, and then you watch high school wrestling of like a Wade Shallis coming through. Even in high school, Wade had really good mat savvy and mat wrestling because those college wrestlers that became high school coaches, when you went into practice, Gusty Augustino, that was the, the Hall of Fame North Allegheny wrestling coach. I can remember as a little kid, we would come into some practices. He would make me sit there and watch. And he would say, okay, today's practice, we're going over takedowns. And it was an all takedown day. And then you'd come in other days and he would say, today is all mat wrestling. The whole day was live wrestling, but on the mat, right? And I, as I travel the country recruiting, I'll go in and watch a high school practice. And I would, if I were to put it in a percentage, I think most coaches come into these high school practices and they spend 80% of the time on a high crotch, a single, a double, or a variation thereof. Mm -hmm a little bit of time on defense, almost nothing on the mat wrestling. So, but in Pennsylvania, it's different. I still, to this day, will go into a high school room and they're teaching a switch. Clint Musser and I used to disagree and argue all the time because I would say, these guys need to learn how to do a, a, a switch. Like it's third grade wrestling. They know how to do it. And Clint was like, it's third grade wrestling. They don't need to know how to do third grade <laughs> wrestling. They need to know how to defend a single leg, right? So there's the Ohio, Pennsylvania, like. Sounds like we need to get you two on for a debate. Yeah. <laughs> we, we could debate a lot. <laughs> Musk gets going. Musk gets, got, Musk he gets knows. going. Musk knows. Musk knows. <laughs> hey, uh, Teague, when, uh, you know, we talk about Ohio PA, obviously that's a big thing, but 
My brother Ferd and I were talking the other day. Uh, Jared brought it up, the Milkoviches. One of their guys, this guy Conrad Callender, just passed away. He was an All-American at Michigan State. And I screenshot and posted, I think, the 74, 1974 uh, National Championships. Clarion had three champs. It was either – I want to say it was 74. Clarion yeah. had three champs. Yeah. Would they not score Clarion in that? Is that – what? Correct. What happened if they would because Ferd's like Ferd, my brother Ferd's like, hey, you gotta find out. I need to know. He keeps calling me. Yeah. He's like, you, hey, did you get the answer on that yet? So then I was is, like, this is how it was explained to me. And the guy that you want to interview on this is either Bub, call call Bub and, and Bob Bub will explain it to you, or Jack Davis, which both of them, either of them for an interview would be phenomenal. Um, I've interviewed is, Davis. I interviewed Jack Davis. So this is the way they explained it to me. You didn't have division one, division two. You had university division and college division at that time. And if you won the college division, you could go and wrestle at the university division. Okay. So it was kind of like when Carlton Hasselrig wrestled and, and if you won D2s, you could go to D1s. Right. But the only guys that were going to the universities is if you won the college division. So there are three guys that won it. I think they took four because I think they had four guys win the college division and then they were able to move up and go and wrestle at the university division. So I, although they had three champs, they didn't have the team that like a university uh, in 73, who would that have been? Iowa? Um, uh, I forget who it was. It's Oklahoma, Iowa, Oklahoma State, Iowa State. I forget yeah, it was, it's one of the big fours. Um, that those were bringing their whole team of 10 guys, right? So even yeah. if you get three champs and then you get a team of 10 that's putting all those points up on the front side and the back side, it's not enough to, to, to bring home a team title. But they, they, they wouldn't let them score is the thing. Yeah, the I, don't, I don't think I, you're correct. I don't think they, they even kept the team score for them at the university division. They'd have been like second or third probably. Yeah. That's and, amazing. And, and when you check on this, I probably completely butchered that and screwed that up. And so you can just edit that part out of this. <laughs> I think but. you're probably right, though. That's probably some some truth to it because Ferd kept he, – dude, he's obsessed with it. Yeah. He calls well, me twice a day asking about it. It is very strange. It is very strange that they had – in three legitimate champs. They had two the year before, Elbow Simpson and, and Chalice. And then in 73, they came back and they had Chalice, uh, Gary. Oh man. I would have to get, I would have to jog my memory again on the clarion. Was it Roan? Was Roan one? Yeah. Of them? Donnie Roan won it as a freshman. Chalice yeah. won it as a junior. And then there's one more in there. That's so crazy. I remember the, and one of the guys looks like he just got out of, like a prison camp. It, like, it looks like one of these World War II movies. He just triage, got out of a prison triage camp. unit. Yeah. He looks so bad. He yeah. looks, you know what guy I'm talking about? Yeah, I he do. He looks horrible. I'm going to text it to you. When yeah. I get his, I always see it. I'm like, oh my God. And he's, and his face is sucked in. He's got two black eyes. Oh, yeah. He looks oh, yeah. like just, oh, he looks like he just got out oh, of he an went, axe murder. He movie. went through, he went through two national tournaments back to back. Right. He did, he did the, the college division one weekend Unreal, and then the next man. weekend they get in a van and drive to who knows where. And then they wrestle a university division against, like we had said, all of your Oklahoma, Iowa States in their heydays in the seventies. It's just incredible. So, okay. I, I, I keep trying to, I, I like to ask you about Ty. Ty's been gone. This year will be seven years. He died. He passed away in 2014. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Ty was, he was everything to you, right? That's who you looked up to. You grew up underneath watching Ty. And then obviously Brinzer was on that team. Catalano was on that team. You grew up with some all-time Pennsylvania greats on that team. Yeah. What was it like growing up with a brother like, like Ty Moore? You know, one of the first Pennsylvania. How, what number was he, by the way, as the four-time state champion PA? He, he was the very first triple-A state champ, four-timer. So first. He was the first triple A, but there were, I believe, four before him that won it when there was no classification. The only one class, right? It was a four time Pennsylvania state champion. The guy that had won it prior to Ty was uh, Mike Johnson from, I believe, Lockhaven. 
Lock Haven or Belfont maybe. Um, but it was like 20 years prior. And then, so Ty kind of was the icebreaker. And then you just have a deluge of four timers. Ty does it, then Hughes does it, then Kerry does it, then Jeremy Hunter does it. Then it was like, or Bob, Bob Crawford was in there. It was like once Ty did it, then there was just bang, bang. There was a, a string of them. And then it's been kind of inter, intermittent ever since. So, but it, so to answer your question, growing up, growing up under Ty was very, uh, it was really, it was brutal. Um, there was a big shoes to fill, right? Everybody knew who my brother was. Um, everybody expected me to do the things that he did, right? And I failed miserably very quickly. My freshman year, I didn't even qualify to the States, right? My season ended at the Whippeals, right? And I hung my head in shame. Um, it, but then it encouraged me to become successful on the freestyle front because, and, and there was a very distinctive conversation. My dad sat me down at one point and said, look, you keep trying to be your brother and you, you're not gonna be your brother. Like, you need to come up with your own goals and become who you are going to be. And so I did a little bit of soul searching and the names that you mentioned, Brinzer was winning Fargo, but it wasn't Fargo. Then it was just junior nationals in, in uh, Iowa city. Uh, Catalano was winning. And so I said, you know what, I'm, I'm I want to become good in freestyle. And so John Smith was, you know, winning everything at that time and Kenny Monday. And so those guys became my icons. And I said, after my freshman year of not even going to Pennsylvania States, I was very blessed to have an assistant coach coming in, come into North Allegheny. His name is, is Herb Monroe. Now it's Dr. Herb Monroe. He's uh, a superintendent of schools down here in the state of Virginia. He only, he, he lives like 75 miles from me right now. Short little black guy, 118 pounder at Lock Haven. He came in and kicked the living crap out of me every single day, my whole sophomore year. And he helped me develop into the, to the wrestler that I eventually became. And even he said, you, you got to make sure you're being yourself because be growing up under Ty's shadow was really difficult. And I struggled with it like big time. I, they, my parents were Western Pennsylvania parents. There wasn't a psychologist that they were going to send me to, right? It was the school of hard knocks, like quit crying, do more work, shut your mouth. Um, over time, I realized Ty, Ty did a good thing in giving me a blueprint of what success, how to get to success in the sport of wrestling. He also gave me a blueprint of how not to handle academics, right? And he flat out told me, don't handle your academics like I did because when he was in college and really struggling, he, he realized in college, the academics were a very big part of what needed to happen. And he didn't have it, right? He just flat out said to me, look, I don't know how to study. I struggle with all of the things you gotta be good at in school. Uh, so make sure you're different at it. So that truly helped me truly helped me. And even though I joke about going to Oklahoma state and majoring in wrestling, like I still graduated with over a 3.0 in, and, and I thought I wanted to be a history major when I came out of Oklahoma state before I started training for 2000 and 2004. But my brother Ty really set the, the precedence of how to work, how to set your goals, not, not giving up on your goals and those sort of things. So I'm very blessed to be a part of the family. I, I was the youngest of seven kids. He's not the only brother that like helped raise me and make me into the person that I became. Um, I got two sisters that were just as tough on me as my brother Ty was. So, And, you know, you, you sent me your mom's obituary. Sorry, she recently passed away. And your mom, you guys, that woman lived. She left a legacy. She yeah. actually, your mom actually had how many kids total did she had? She gave birth to how many kids? 10. She had 10. 10. And yeah. you lost, we well, had twin. You had a set of twins, right? Yeah. They would, they would have been the oldest. And okay. then there was a single birth that would have been older than Ty, younger than my sister, Tina. And so they lost three and seven of us um, survived. Yeah. That's and there's, there's, there's five of us alive right now. So, 
and yeah, in success, yeah. my, my mom, as you were joking about the other night, my mom's from a huge family. She was number three of 18 kids, oh. <laughs> all single birth. There were no twins wow. from grandma and grandpa. And my parents had 10. And as I jokingly told you, and I jokingly say to everybody, my grandparents and my parents never had cable. So, <laughs> right? so I didn't know what family. was causing it. <laughs> I didn't know what was causing it, right? So uh, you know, hey, and, and, and this is a question I wanted to ask both of you. This is a question for Jared and Tig. What is it like to be a parent of twins? You guys are both parents oh, of twins, twins okay. right? Yeah, I do. You go first, Jared. Uh, I've I twin. I've said a few times. Twin daughters, I, and they're couldn't believe couldn't be more opposite and I, I don't know I love it uh uh and my wife uh you know I come from all boys so it was all new for me uh, I had two stepdaughters but uh the the twins are it's you know four girls it's pretty all new to me obviously but I, I I love it every day and it's uh you know when one's having a good day the other's usually having a bad you know it's I mean, they they try to be opposite and it's just you try to treat them as you know daughters not twins that's that's my thing you know you try to teach them treat them as individuals you know everyone's like how's the twins like no how's you know how's camden okay it's not the twins that that's the way i guess i approach it i don't know if it's right or wrong but you know there's no uh, manual uh, at least that i found for twins and everyone so that, that's the way i treat it i love it you know, I, I love being you know girl dad so i don't know yeah so i i've got uh boy and girl twins uh maximus and madigan and they're 11 now Cool. And it's been interesting um, for them growing up when they were really little, they were, they were super tight, like played together, kind of had their own little language and interaction and relationship. And then in elementary, we started to, my ex-wife and I start, we, we made the decision to separate them in school. And so we noticed within the first year, that wasn't working out very well. What year did you do that right away or? I believe it was um, second grade, okay. I think is when we Third did that. First grade this year, we're going to do it. And then with COVID, the school has to put them together for, for you know, family reasons. You know, instead yeah. of splitting up fans, they, I think four sets of twins in the class, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, so we did, we did split them. And it was interesting because the, the, their teachers kind of, um, kept us up to date and, and they struggled a little bit. And so as they got older, then we, we've given them the ability that if they want to be in the same class, they can. But um, now that they're in fifth grade, they're, uh, they're kind of on their own paths. And mm -hmm. as everybody, they start to develop their own little personalities and, and those sort of things. But um, is one take the like motherly or father, like the, the daughter kind of, she kind of the oversee that the, the, your son or how's that work she she doesn't like i would call that mother henning like mm -hmm, she right. doesn't mother hen too much he probably he he's very protective even though when they're in the house he's not protective of her at all but when they go to school he's very protective of her right <laughs> um and that was not anything that like you know we sit down and say hey you got to protect your sister and watch out it's just a natural instinct mm -hmm. he could pick on her but as soon as somebody else right. picked on her like it's it's time yeah. to fight yeah yeah no, yeah. <laughs> yeah so they're in the same class they're they're getting their own group of friends now it's kind of cool to see you know i was kind of worried that was you know especially in the covid you know being around i was actually talking to my oldest daughter on the ride home from basketball night like you know, her frustrations as the older sister, like, you know, can you imagine being around someone 24 hours a day? I, mean, I, I couldn't do it, but, uh, but they're starting to get their own identity. So it's, it's fun to see. Yeah. That's cool. Are, is anybody wrestling Tig? Is, is any of your uh, kids wrestling? Three of my four tried it. So my 14 year old daughter tried it for two seasons. Um, the twins both did it for two seasons but at this point, nobody wanted to move on with it. So, so we, we like, we dipped our toe in the pool. Um, we have a great little system down here in Maryland. Um, the club that our kids were going to is the same club that Helen Marola started in. Oh, wow. And coach Christian who coached Helen when she got started also coached my three. And that's where Clint's daughter, by the way, you guys have an Olympic champion female wrestler in Ohio right now. Clint's daughter is Naomi. Yeah. I was going to bring I'm her up earlier. I'm telling yeah. you right now, 
she is going to be yeah. an NCAA champion, a world champion, an Olympic champion. She's on that type of trajectory. She's awesome. And so she just wrestled in Jared's tournament. Yeah. She okay. Back in December that Clinton, Naomi were there and you know, just yeah. Clint's insights crazy. So you know, he's going to have her on the right path. Right. Oh yeah. I, oh yeah, exactly. They, um, they were all on the same little youth team down here together. And, um, my kids just didn't, they don't, they didn't have the itch for it. And so I, I didn't, I'm not going to be one of those parents that just keeps ramming it down their throats. So my daughter, the twin daughter is, she did gymnastics at a pretty high level for a number of years. So now she's transitioned that into diving. My son's not really doing much of anything in terms of sports. Um, so we're just kind of taking it one year at a time. COVID's throwing a twist into everything as you guys know. Right. Yeah, no doubt, man. Holy smokes. We still get to go to youth practices. I get to take my kids to youth practice two nights a week, and there's it's awesome. I love it, and they love it. They love it. My one kid got his face kicked in the other night pretty good, and um, at the end of the practice, he was like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> and then the coach yells, Jeff Barney's the coach. He's like, all right, everybody down for push-ups. And he's like, no, I want to do push-ups, though. And – he does the 10 push-ups, and by the end, he's like, I go, All right, what's wrong? Are you okay? And he's like, yeah, I'm fine. What are you talking about? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the their, transition. Their memory, their memory at that age is priceless because something can happen, and 60 seconds later, it's gone. It's but a memory, right? Yeah. And Jeff so. Varney's a good good coach, yeah, too. Yeah, really what? good youth coach, man. The, the what guys that, that they work what, with. What's the ice cream and the – What's the oh ice cream and poop for a for a knee slide? Post your hand on the mat, and then yeah, he's, it, ice cream and poop. You know, keep your hand up here so they can't get inside. Ice cream, and then the other hand, the post hand, smash the poop on the mat. And I was like, what is this guy? And I videoed it, and I think I did. I post it, Jared. I think I, I posted it on some social media. I got it. it. Right. And I'm like, what? I've never heard of ice cream and poop, and my kids love, <laughs> love it. it. Yeah, yeah, don't eat the poop, Dad. It's great. They love it. It's they'll, a never great association. it. No. they'll never, never forget it. They'll never forget it, they'll never get it wrong. No, and they're going to have good knee slides and good back pressure and post on the mat, keep their elbow in. And he's positive, yeah. man. Oh, he's positive. Yeah, at least every positive time I talk guy. to him, awesome. Coach. Great guy. Great guy. Bus- uh, small business owner in here around here. Going to move down the road a mile and a half, uh, built, building, moving down the road because they wouldn't allow him build, to build a wrestling gym and his, to add on to his house. Well, they wouldn't approve the drawings. So he's like, all right, I'm selling my house. And he moved. Right. Yeah. Building the house down the road with a wrestling gym built into it. Yeah. Some sort of township rule or uh, yeah, whatever, or ah, whatever. Name I don't know, whatever. Something arbitrary and made up. Yeah. But if you grease the right people, you get the place. You get the check mark, you get right? The permit, yeah. Yeah, you know how it goes. Come on, right? Bureaucracies, yeah. right? Take. There's a lot uh, of them out there. You gotta love it. You live at the epicenter of it. Good for you. Hey, it's going to be a bumpy me, ride here for a little while. It's going to be a bumpy ride for a while. As we saw today, man, it was wild at the Capitol building. It was mm. crazy, but Hey, that's how it goes. Jared, can you give us a quick, okay. So this is the barbarian hour Teague. Okay. So we do got to talk about what we do with our product, the bar- barbarian apparel, right? Okay. And when you watch this, if you watch it or if you listen to it on Spotify or Apple Podcast, we talk about Barbarian Apparel. It's Josh Sasfi. He does a great job. And then Jared will have usually some type of product that we talk about. Jared, do we have anything this week? Are we going to see Josh this week at all? Yeah, actually, we're seeing this uh, weekend at our tournament. He'll be there with some gear. And, um, you know, he does a great job, as we talked about. And uh, actually, he did these hats, the hat I have on. He can do hats. I mean, even so, it's not BA branded, but. Uh, this is uh, our youth club here in town. Um, my brother's a coach of that, but uh, yeah, Josh is a great guy. Real grab good that kid. West Point one. I see the West Point one in the background. Oh, grab yeah, that West grab Point that. one and show it. Let me grab that. It's got a pretty cool West Point one. He does hats. So it's uh, you know, the stitching and all that stuff, but yeah, he does all kinds of stuff. But uh, He's Josh, the a impossible. great guy. He's doing a great, yeah, great mm-hmm. guy. We work with him, and that's who the podcast is. He got us the sick flag. 
Tig, I might have to send you some Ohio cast stuff. And Beautiful. we got we got stuff here for the the podcast. And yeah, we got to get you hooked up. Um anything, any good you guys stories. May you gear, by the way. I, I'm not scared. My wife right. still has the red hoodie. She's got this red Nike hoodie. It's sick, dude. My wife still wears that thing because you, you're like, here, will you wear a medium or a large? I'm like, no, but my and she was my girlfriend at the time. Hey, when I came for that thing with yeah. Martin, I was in DC with Martin, if you remember. Yeah. Um, that was to we went and did a piece on Jim Jordan. Oh, okay. You were down at the Capitol for that. Yes. And Jim Jordan rolled out the red carpet for us and his aide. It's like the aide that was with him, the like girl, that the woman who was, you know, that handled everything whenever, you know, her insulator, right? Yeah. The go between. She was like, she pulled us to a side and she goes, just so you know, Jim doesn't treat any media like this. <laughs> You're she not just in media. That. <laughs> no. And that was crazy to me because, you know, obviously when you're, you know, 90% of the media is liberal yeah. and we're, we're, we're wrestling guys. So we're Martin, you know, Martin's a business owner. I'm a centrist. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care. And they let us walk into Paul Ryan's office and video shoot B roll. Steve Scalise was in there, dude. It was awesome. We got to go in chambers. We got to do all of his stuff and Martin videoed it all. That's incredible. It was that, amazing. That, that's, that's a, that's a true behind the scenes tour. It was legit behind the scenes it was it was something else so only only something zeb gets right zeb oh, gets I was the, pumped. Zeb he gets the rare good. stuff so beautiful do you have anything else um i forgot to mention uh josh has a new it's barbarianapparel.com slash ba hour and he's putting like specials and things like that for our listeners so if you're right. listening check out what he has new or deals going on so another plug for josh and, and all he does for the sport small business he does a good job so do you guys mind if I plug AU real quick? No, that, that's, that's oh, why we're here, man. Really? That's what Come we're here man. for. Yeah, yeah. All Come right. on. All right. So uh, it's, a, it's a strange year, as you all know. We're, we're getting ready. We are set to compete against Navy on January 25th and then again on the 29th. So we're doing a home and an away with them. Oh, wow. And then in February, we will see uh, George Mason, Lehigh, and Bucknell. And uh, those are going to be on the road. But the, the, the thing I would like everyone to keep an eye out for, uh, Gage Curry, who, depending upon the ranking that you see, I think Flo has him at 11 right now at 125 pounds. Um, he is, uh, he's a fifth year senior. He lost, as they all did, his juniors last year. So he was qualified for the Nationals as a third time last year. He's back at 125. Keyshawn Clark, our 149 pounder, really had a breakout year last year ranked as high as seventh at one point in the season, um, qualified to the nationals last year through the EIWAs, but didn't get a chance to compete. He went and competed in U 23s freestyle and took fourth. So nice. I, I, we expect Keyshawn's going to be able to put together a good season, uh, this year. Um, we also have two other guys that placed in the EIWAs, Tim Fitzpatrick, who was just a sophomore last year at 165, Anthony Wokash, placed at EIWAs last year. Uh, he will be a fifth year senior as well. And then Nico Camacho, our heavyweight that also placed at EIWA. So um, we got a, we got a few, few very good guys that uh, you're going to be able to see do well this season. It's a strange season uh, with all this COVID stuff going on. The training has not been the normal type of training. Competition doesn't look like it's going to be the normal type of competition. So I just encourage all of you college wrestling fans out there, when you see these college wrestlers hitting the mats, do what you can to support them because these guys are are really coming through the toughest time in any of their careers just to be able to step on the mat. They haven't had the normal preseason summer times uh, to be ready for this. So support your local college wrestling program. If you're in D.C., you won't be able to come to any home matches at AU, but support us however you can. And we greatly will it be live streamed. It. How the kind of yeah, game? yeah. Everything we do this year will be live streamed, whether it's home or away. Um, it should be live streamed, correct? Through your through your university. university. Or, okay, yeah. awesome. And with those matches this year, I've seen some people doing it. Will you set up some like uh, you know 
exhibition matches? If you're making the trip, are you just taking your starters or how, how's that working? No, we hope to take anybody that is able to wrestle and give them a chance to get a matchup. So if you're not in the starting lineup, then be able to get some extra matches. Um, what we're going to do at American is we're going to put down two mats. We're not going to be using two mats mm -hmm. per se, but you'll wrestle, we'll wrestle 25 on mat A, clean mat A as 33 wrestles on B, okay. and then go back to mat A for 41 as we're cleaning mat B. So we're going to be doing a shifting back and forth and try to get everybody as much matches as possible. Um, I just feel bad for, for wrestlers in general in, in, in any of these kids going through what they're going through right now. So it's just a strange time, and right. I hope they get the opportunity to compete. At such a pivotal, Teague. pivotal time in their life, like like you yeah. said earlier. Go ahead, Zeb. What's that? Yeah, Teague. Uh, first things first. Will you get to keep all those guys? Will Clark come back for next year as well? Yeah. Okay. Will you get to keep those guys an additional year? Will money allow you to? I don't know. I don't know how you guys are logistically going to do that. I don't know how you're yeah. financially and logistically going to do that. It really is is a it, it's really tough for the seniors right now being recruited in high school, right? Yeah. That's what really affects. Their, okay, so will you keep those guys another year if they want to? And yeah. will it be Cobb and Clark in the Navy match? It could be, yes. That's a big one. Yeah. That's a great matchup. Yeah. So to answer your question about the seniors, so our seniors, we've given everybody the opportunity that if they want to come back and compete next year, they have that opportunity. And then financially, we, we find a way to make it work for them. Um, and we asked that question early on and recruited accordingly, right? So if they said, yes, I plan on coming back. So you asked about Keyshawn Clark. Keyshawn, he's just a really, really special kid. He is in his fifth year of wrestling at American, but he's in his first year of law school. So he finished his undergrad, wow. applied and wow. got accepted to our law school. He's the first guy I've coached in 20 years of college coaching that's doing law school. Um, so he's doing his first year of law school. He's going to wrestle this year. He gets to come back next year and will wrestle as a second year law student. And uh, yeah, he's just, again, goes back to our previous conversation. He's a great example. We're, we're graduating three out of four of our American university wrestlers right now with master's degrees, as well as their undergrad. Wow. Keyshawn really stepped it up. He finished his undergrad and then decided to apply to the law school, got accepted. And so now he's, uh, he's on his way to be an attorney. That's so awesome. that's unreal. Hopefully I'll get me out of some, that's awesome. Some speeding tickets in the future. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is amazing. Teague. Wow. And you're bringing all those guys back. I don't know how you guys do it, but that's awesome. Good for you, man. Yeah. That is Thanks. awesome. I can't believe how, how much of a rookie mistake that was for me to not ask you to plug American U. I, I don't know where I'm at. My, my mind's out of it right now. I must be thinking about that big playoff game this weekend where the Steelers are going to bring their not JVs to the stadium at, at Heinz Field and – Cleveland's not even going to have their head coach on the sidelines because he's got COVID and we got a bunch of other guys missing. And so now you're we're going to have to play the result with is not going to look the same. It will not be the same. No. Okay. It will not be close. Because I have a lot of friends in Pittsburgh that are, they're very upset about the last result. So you sent not your hall of fame quarterback and your hall of fame defensive end. That's what you did. Okay. So that's what ha you're not going to win. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Cleveland's bad though. No, they're better. They're better. Hold on, hold on. They are, better. They are way they're better. better. They are way they're better. better. Yeah. They're better. They're better. They're better. I'll I'll say and, they're better. Okay. And they're not only better. They're competitive in a division that's you know, arguably Killer. one of the toughest in football right now. Right. Yeah, it's amazing oh, yeah. to me. You got a division like that, and then your big money markets of garbage. New York, right. New garbage. York, Dallas. Like, yes. It's wild. It's so crazy. wild. It's crazy. Can't finish above five hundred. When Sad. you're when you're four and six or four and seven and you're talking about a playoff spot, I said, what are they doing to the playoffs? Are they just letting anybody in now? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, they got you know, depending that, upon man. the division you're in, um, that can happen. Yeah, you're right. You're <laughs> right. We'll let it slide this time. Yeah. You got anything else for us, Tig? No, I just want to say thank you to you guys. I, I love getting a chance to do this stuff and you guys uh 
you brought up a lot of old wrestling stuff, which I love talking wrestling history. Um, you know, uh, so I, I just appreciate what you guys do for the sport and, you know, bringing me on to where I can talk about American university and our wrestlers in the wrestling program. I just greatly appreciate it because, um, we, we, we fight to get our name out there and let people know, like I said, we're a diamond in the rough and the more people that can hear about American and are willing to jump on the internet and look us up. It's not hard once you see our academic results and what we can do for somebody that wants to wrestle division one, we're a special place to be. Yeah. And the connection to DC is undeniable, obviously. Yeah. That's it's awesome. crazy. That's really cool. All right, Jared, you good? I'm good. Thanks for your coach, man. Th thanks for your yeah. time, coach. Thank you. Yeah, no Appreciate problem. Appreciate it. Tig, I'll be in, thank I'll you. in touch with you guys to get you some gear out. Yeah, cool. All right. Thanks, thanks Tig. Man. Take care, guys. All right. Good one. All right, Jared, I'm out of here. Have a good one, guys. See you. Yep.